David Lynch is notorious for his unique and often intentionally abrasive style. He is viewed in layman's terms as weird and in academic terms as Lynchian. This Lynchian style is characterized by unexpected and sudden tonal shifts and dips into surrealist imagery, incoherent plots that tie through several different narratives that never lead anywhere, and rather abstract and unclear meaning that leave detractors feeling like his films are pointless. His films feel very unnatural at times, and simultaneously get the reputation of being purely aesthetic experiences with no deeper meaning at all, and of being masterfully mapped out with every fine detail being accounted for and only being able to be understood through a series of codes and clues that Lynch leaves viewers to construct a story out of. Both of these instincts, I feel, are a bit out of place with what Lynch is really doing and are both born of the same desire, for a story to make sense, logically speaking. He wouldn't even get this reputation if his films didn't have so much in them in terms of traditional filmmaking. If he had made much weirder films, more akin to that of the 90s experimental horror film Begotten, nobody would be trying to piece together secret narratives or looking for it to have a story where there is none. Basically, it's because Lynch's films feel like they have a story that convinces people that there must be some way in which it either all comes together and makes perfect logical sense, or doesn't and is just incoherent. There is a clear distinction to make between amateur and often unintentional dives into surrealist filmmaking and that of Lynch's work. If you've ever seen an overly ambitious student film, you can easily find plenty of examples of meaningless aesthetic experiences that don't cohere into something that merits discussion. If you've ever seen a poorly made independent film or a Z-grade film, you can find plenty of examples of movies that tried to have a story but were botched along the way. Lynch is definitely not flying solely by the seat of his pants or deliberately making something meaningless for viewers to then give meaning through interpretation. There's a reason why his style is referred to as Lynchian, and it's because it's relatively consistent among a lot of his work, the sort of intangible thing that Lynch has that lesser surrealist filmmakers don't. But I don't believe that understanding Lynch's movies or his style depends solely on acknowledging his aesthetic trademarks or alternatively trying to decode it as though it's a puzzle box with a clear solution once you can figure out what it is. What if I told you that there's another way to look at his work, one that helps to find threads in his work through which interpretations can be made, but doesn't necessarily require finding an absolute, singular, one true meaning to anything he makes? All it requires is some understanding of political and philosophical theories, some 20th century US history, and how these things apply to Lynch's work. Rather than discussing Lynch's style or his ideas, we're going to discuss the ideas behind his styles and ideas, of which there is actually a lot of precedent. Basically, Lynch's work is both about and reflective of the postmodern condition. Lynch's original work, basically all of it, is in some way or another about topics that relate to our technological, psychological, and political state of postmodernity in America after World War II and into contemporary society and art. Lynch employs postmodern filmmaking conventions and tells postmodern stories about postmodern society. So what the hell does any of that mean? Good question, but it's also going to take a while to get to answering that, because in order to understand how Lynch's work reflects and comments on postmodernity, we have to know what postmodernity is. And to know what that is, we also have to understand postmodernism, postmodern theory, and how and why postmodernism is reacting to modernity and modernism, which will also require some explanation. Once we have at least a cursory understanding of these topics, Lynch's strange style and narrative structures will make a bit more sense, and we can get away from the one absolute truth way of looking at Lynch's work, which has never been intended to have any sense of absolute truth to begin with. From there, I hope you'll join me as I look at all of the major original Lynch works through a postmodernist lens and share how I personally interpret Lynch's art. I encourage people to also share their own interpretations and hopefully we can have a worthwhile discussion. So hello, and welcome to my video series on David Lynch. This video series will cover the bulk of Lynch's original works through several different academic frameworks, focusing primarily on philosophical and political themes that emerge. Starting with Eraserhead and ending with Twin Peaks The Return, we'll cover the consistencies and the changes over time and develop an understanding of how Lynch's works relate to philosophical and political ideologies that are informed by the eras in which he released these works. Here's how this series will go. In this video, I'll discuss postmodern theory and discuss Lynch's history and how the two relate to one another, in order to map out a thesis for my interpretation of Lynch's major body of original work. The thesis will be useful for understanding every original work in Lynch's career that I cover, and will hopefully be a nice reference point for viewers to return to if they begin to lose track of what concepts I'm referring to when I discuss postmodernism, postmodernity, and the American political landscape that Lynch found himself in as a child of 1950s America.
In the rest of the series, I'll discuss the major original Lynch works in chronological order. Eraserhead, Blue Velvet, Twin Peaks, Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, Dumbland, Rabbits, Inland Empire, and finally Twin Peaks The Return. For the record, I'll combine Rabbits with Inland Empire as it's mostly supplemental to that film. I won't cover Lynch's short films because they don't really fit in with the major thesis of this series and don't seem to relate too heavily to his other work. Any of his other more minor works, such as some of his paintings or his music career or his unfinished Ronnie Rocket project, may be referenced and sprinkled throughout the series, but there won't be any whole videos dedicated to anything beyond the major projects I mentioned. Now, before I get to the thesis for the series, I would like to discuss postmodern theory first so that it makes more sense why Lynch would be making the kinds of films and series that he makes, and why the thesis I'm going to state later makes sense in terms of the grander cultural context to which Lynch's films exist. So let's start with a very basic rundown of postmodernity and postmodern theory. We have to go all the way back to the Middle Ages to give postmodernism its proper context, so forgive me if this sounds a bit strange at first. In the Middle Ages, because the Catholic Church had risen to near complete political and social dominance over most of Europe, we were essentially in an age of God, in which God, as interpreted by Catholicism, held the keys to all scientific, political, social, and moral truths. Indeed, Catholicism was the keeper of the very concept of truth itself. During the modern era, a number of technological advancements and a lot of political upheaval led to the loosening of the Catholic Church's grip on truth and power. The Protestant Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and various political conflicts such as the American and French Revolutions allowed for people to defy Catholic power, start their own religions, and even advance science and social structures greatly. It was during this era that we entered into the age of colonialism, and the effects of colonialism had been felt greatly through the entire world. It was also the time of capitalism and the rise of the merchant and capitalist classes. We had entered an age of man, so to speak, where scientific, political, social, and moral truths had been held not by God or by God-ordained kings, but by human beings who could discover truth through scientific inquiry and political observation. If you think of the Middle Ages in which God held power over what was considered truth as that of old truth, then the modern age was the age of new truths. Postmodernism exists primarily as a response to modernism, and modernism is a philosophy that emphasizes the new truths of the modern era. With the ever-relaxing grip over truth and power that the Catholic Church had, European men sought to discover the new truths that the Church's failures had left unseen. Witches and demonic possession had been discovered instead to be mental illness. Great diseases as punishments from God had been discovered to be microbiological viruses. In the modern era, humanity seemed to have no limitation that could stop us. Colonization, globalization, the industrial revolution, the development of steam engines, trains, and even cars. What once held us to God's power had been replaced by the power that man discovered it could have all on its own. To quote Nietzsche, God is dead. Modernism was all about understanding the state of modernity, understanding the new truths of society, and rejecting the old conventions and traditions of the old world. This applied to art, it applied to philosophy, to science, and to politics. Modernism is the ideology of the expansion of the truth of the human condition as helmed by man himself. So then what is postmodernism? Well, postmodernism is a movement that spawned in the 20th century that looked at all of this great expansion in the modern era with a skeptical eye, and questioned the narratives of new truth that modernity had set out to define for itself. If you picture a post-apocalyptic landscape in which a bomb had wiped out the majority of the population of a society, then you could easily see the society as existing in two historical states, before the bomb and after the bomb. The same could be said of almost any major societal shift, before the colonization of the New World and after, before the rise of Catholicism and after. Postmodernism is a reflection of the postmodern condition, that is, the era after the rise of modernity. Some argue that modernity never ended, but postmodern theory puts it at some point in the 20th century, and for the sake of this series, I'm going to say it caps right at the end of World War II. What about World War II made it such a significant event that it ended the notion of modernity? 
Well, modernity was an era of great expansion, but it was also both a metaphorical and literal bomb waiting to go off. The two world wars, collectively, were the moment where the bomb of modernity had finally gone off. While the modern era was a rather turbulent time politically and socially with great wars, massacres, genocides, and violence, it was the two world wars, and particularly World War II, that showed us that the state of modernization could, in fact, kill us all. In the time of the Age of God, it was God that could smite humanity with such great force. In the time of the Age of Man, such power wasn't noticeable. The two world wars were the moment when humanity had to contend with the possibility of its own self-annihilation. And it would be through this great modernist expansion that it would be possible. The development of advanced weaponry allowed for the usage of atomic bombs that could wipe out entire societies in an instant. The development of planes, cars, tanks, guns, automatic weaponry, and so much more were all leading to the point of the two great wars. The political revolutions of the modern era eventually helped to inspire that of Nazi Germany, and we saw the results of this with the Holocaust. And what political theory did for the rise of the Nazis, scientific theory helped with the rise of Nazi ideology. Arianism and Nazi-era anti-Semitism, including the atrocities committed in the Holocaust, were influenced by phrenology and eugenics, among other things. These new truths had consequences, and they had great consequences, catastrophic or even apocalyptic in nature. Modernization and industrialization were a great win in the sales of philosophy under modernism, but they were in a way a great atrocity as well, and they proved that man didn't need God to strike us down, we can do it ourselves. So the state of post-modernity is the state at which industrial, political, and ideological expansion become impossible to stop or slow down, and the state in which we all must continue to live on this trajectory even as it keeps us permanently on the brink of complete extinction. Postmodern theory tries to understand the state of postmodernity in which modernism had shown itself to be a great disaster to humanity in many respects through a rejection of the ideas of modernism as a philosophy. This means rejecting the ideas of the new truths of man. So if you're wondering what postmodern theory puts forth as truth to follow the truth of God and the truth of man, the answer is that well, postmodern theory doesn't really concern itself with truth as much as previous ideologies had, but if I were to put a phrase on it, it would be the truth of power. The idea that man could discover reality and go against the will of God, the previous keeper of truth, well, it's a great idea in theory, but who was writing these new truths? Often it was white European men of middle or upper class status. Hell, calling all of humanity man leaves at least 50% of the population out of this notion of truth. The reason why white European men of middle or upper class status were able to discover these truths is because they had more social, cultural, and systemic power. Colonization had done a lot to benefit the colonizer, but resulted in massacre, genocide, and enslavement for the colonized. These groups continued to exist despite their lesser status of power or humanity in the eyes of Europeans, and they continued to exist into the postmodern era, and they fought back. The narratives of colonialism were held by European colonizers during the modern era, and since they could control the narrative, they could control truth. But their truths inevitably led to genocide, destruction, and massacre, because that is what happens when one holds power. So in this sense, truth is defined by those who hold power. I'm sure you've heard the phrase before that history is written by the victors. This phrase is a phrase that borrows from a postmodern mindset, that of truth being defined by who has the power to define it. So, with that out of the way, I can finally explain what postmodern theory is at its most basic level, and I mean extremely basic. Postmodern theory postulates that, while there is some kind of external reality to us, from our very birth, we are subjected to a series of ideas, through socialization, through our environmental and social pool, and through the structures we find ourselves in, such as family, school, and cultural zeitgeist. These series of ideas are out of our control and run fundamentally through our language itself. In order to think as social agents, we first need to develop the capacity for language, and even the languages we are taught are limited in being able to connect us to reality. The minute we transfer our minds from the real to the true, from what exists in the physical world to the ideas and symbols and words we use to describe our physical reality, our understanding of that reality is compromised permanently. We can never fully, fully understand reality, and so we are stuck in a state of ignorance where our ability to have senses and cognition both give us a window into reality, but also permanently prevent us from any certainty of what is real.
And truth, for all of its value in helping us understand reality, is compromised by this process. It's compromised by the fact that we are very limited in our perception, and so we are always capable of perceiving false truths. And it's also compromised by the world around us itself. What we are most likely to perceive as true is what we are most likely to be exposed to. If, as a small child, you're raised Christian and believe that the Christian God exists, you have basically no option but to believe that God is real until you are exposed to the idea that he's not. Before this, there is basically no possibility to reject this notion. So truth is dependent on what information you have, and information is easy and also necessary to be controlled and disseminated by others in order for you to obtain it. There's a rather infinite series of different axes of information that are running through your mind at any given time. Information about science, religion, politics, social norms, history, our future. All of this is happening simultaneously so quickly that no individual can fully comprehend it. But our own flaws in comprehension are easy to manipulate, and power dynamics emerge. When a group or idea gains prominence, it can become the predominant idea. Again, using the God example, if you exist in America in like 1950 or so, then you have every reason to believe in the Christian God because at that time, Christianity was the predominant religious idea. It had the most power, so it defined for people at that time what truth was. And the reason why postmodernism doesn't really concern itself with truth is clear when you recognize that many things that are taken to be absolute, obvious, self-evident truths in a society can often just be utterly false, but gain so much power anyways as to seem true. The Middle Ages was a whole, multi-century span of people all being subjected to one prominent, prevailing ideology that wasn't even true. So if it's not true to us, but it was true to them, do we call it truth or not? Well, instead, let's call it narrative. A narrative is basically an idea that we're told and that we tell ourselves that allow us to fathom events in the real world. God is a narrative, as is Zeus or any other religious narrative. But similarly, phrenology is a narrative. The theory of evolution is a narrative. The American Revolution being successful is a narrative. Narratives don't have to be correct or incorrect, and postmodernism isn't as concerned with what is the correct narrative because that is effectively the same exact thing as trying to search for truth. What matters is that some narratives can gain more power in a society than others, as we saw with the God example. Modernists rejected the God narrative and replaced it with the narrative of man, which they found to be more accurate. Postmodernists reject not the God narrative nor the man narrative, but the grand narrative. So what is a grand narrative? Basically, it's an idea that we are told or that we tell ourselves that gains so much prominence as to be the primary or even only narrative we are told about a given topic. Another word for this is the dominant narrative. The dominant narrative of the creation of the earth during the Middle Ages was that God created the earth in seven days. That was the idea that everyone was exposed to, and there basically weren't other narratives about how the earth was formed to go off of. And I'd argue that postmodern theory isn't about rejecting grand narratives, but promoting skepticism of them. After all, narratives become so powerful because they are disseminated by people and by ideologies with power. Modernists were close with their rejection of the narratives of God, but they refused to practice proper skepticism of their own narratives, that of man. Postmodernists look at something like World War II and said that if the narrative of man created this, then we have to question the validity of the narrative of man. So effectively, postmodern theory is about questioning the narratives of those with power and the narratives that gain the most power and become the most prominent that people are exposed to, and try to look for ways in which the construction of truth as determined by people with power can be compromised. They aren't searching for new truths, but acknowledging the possibility of many truths, showing skepticism for those that oppress and inflict harm to the world, and carefully analyzing the processes that weight these narratives differently. Essentially, postmodernists are playing a linguistics game to expose the issues of power in society and its effect on our minds. This is an extreme oversimplification of postmodern theory and postmodernists, but it's useful enough for beginning to understand what is going on with David Lynch's work. So then how does any of this relate to David Lynch? Well, Lynch is an artist who uses postmodern filmmaking and scriptwriting techniques to tell stories about the postmodern era in America and exemplifies postmodern theory through his rejection of grand narratives about post-World War II American conservatism, gender, class, race, and morality with a combination of meta-commentary, genre critique, satire, and somewhat strange and vaguely self-aware spiritual elements.
post-World War II society is a society in which the threat of man-made annihilation is always looming overhead, and we have to contend with past, present, and future atrocities, while at the same time living under the benefits of industrialization and modernization. Life continues to get vastly more complex and incomprehensible as technology changes our lives in ways we can't even begin to fathom, but are suddenly available at our fingertips. Similarly, violence, warfare, and oppression continue to get vastly more complex and the evils of the world grow and grow without us being able to understand what they are and only barely understand that they're even there, though on some level we always know. This is the postmodern condition, and it's what Lynch's entire career bases itself on. How does one continue to try to walk the good path in a world that has lost all sense of moderation, clarity, or even goodness? All of this theory and background eventually stops us a bit short of Lynch's work, which all takes place after about 1960 or so. So then what exactly does postmodernity look like? Well, it's a state in which being naive is a bit of a privilege. America had a huge economic boom because of their role in the victory of World War II against the Axis powers. This gave Americans the opportunity to live in a time of unprecedented prosperity, and gave rise to the American middle class through the advent of suburbia, which was created to give families whose husbands were returning from war a nice little home separate from the busy life of the city, and was made possible by the invention of freeways and an increased usage of cars in the 1950s. The 50s was a time of quiet resignation to the finer things in life. A wonderful home with the husband, wife, and kids, the husband making the money and the woman making the home a nice place to live. The white picket fence, the fresh grass lawn, the nice car, everything. America felt the wind in its sails and everyone prospered, and deservedly so because they helped defeat the Axis powers. This idea, of course, is the grand narrative that we tell ourselves about the 1950s. It was the predominant narrative. But was it an accurate one? Well, historically, no. On the international level, America was entering into the Cold War with Russia, and the Red Scare loomed over Americans both in terms of the threat of nuclear warfare and the threat from the American powers that be on people's lives through the snuffing out of potential communist enemies. Communists became one of an infinite number of boogeymen during this time. There was also the knowledge of the nuclear bomb having been dropped on Japan, which for all intents and purposes was an atrocity against innocent civilians in mass. On the national level, there was major discrimination against people of color who faced severe segregation, discrimination, harassment, violence, redlining, and housing discrimination. Suburbia was a nice image, but it wasn't accessible to anybody but the white middle class, who historically were also the colonizers, the one committing atrocities. And even within the white middle class, there was still a massive campaign against women's rights to work that confined them to the home, and similar campaigns against LGBT people that forced LGBT people into the closet and threatened their livelihoods. And women who were confined to the home were often subjected to a high number of domestic rapes, beatings, and emotional abuse. Women were brutalized by the nuclear family model, and so were their children, who were subjected to similar abuse from their fathers. In order to make women follow their husbands' demands, health professionals would force unruly wives to undergo electroshock treatments. Literally, women were being tortured into doing what their husbands told them. This pristine Norman Rockwell image of the 1950s, it never existed outside of its presence as an image. If you want more information on this, and these are the sources I'm pulling from, check out the book The Way We Never Were by Stephanie Kuntz and the documentary Race, The Power of an Illusion. So while the Norman Rockwell image of a simple suburban life seemed omnipresent and has still prevailed as the dominant narrative of 1950s culture, it's not true, and in many ways it was, even at the time, a cover-up for the massive abuse that Americans were enduring from within their own country. It was easy to believe in the more privileged you got, which is why it's still popular among rich conservative men, but it's not something everyone believed, and they voiced their disapproval with the 1960s and 70s, which was a time of great political and social strife in America, where people of color, LGBT people, women, and leftists all fought back against government corruption, social and cultural discrimination, and violence and abuse they were subjected to regularly. This all matters, because Lynch was there for all of it. As a child of the 1950s, he lived out the Norman Rockwell image in real time, but as many kids of his ilk realized, there was something phony and suspicious about it. As he grew into the 60s and 70s, his early adulthood was plagued by poverty and economic disadvantage, as his time in Philadelphia showed. 
His very first feature film, Eraserhead, was about his experiences in Philadelphia. In particular, it showed how his sudden dive into poverty had affected him, as he attended art school in a city that was at the time experiencing a great economic crisis and had inadvertently become a father, thus sort of risking everything as he plunged deeper into poverty. Basically, at some point in his life, the image of 1950s Americana had come crumbling down. At the same time this was happening, huge political uproar was emerging from groups whose abuse had been obscured by the image of 1950s Americana. Basically, the story of the 50s was being retold by those who it had harmed, and Lynch was, in a sense, one of them. But he also benefited from it. He found himself on both ends, that of the 50s dream and the nightmare that it covered up. Lynch's work is all about the tension that being in this position creates and how grand narratives about American culture help to obscure the darkness that emanates from our post-World War II society. He's acknowledging the strange contradiction of the postmodern condition through the lens of his own life in it, and using his own vantage point to comment on the wider political and social problems that have emerged from a sort of blind nostalgia that American culture has had for the 1950s since at least as early as the late 1970s. And with that, we can finally get to our thesis. World War II permanently disrupted the fabric of humanity and the resulting cultural and political circumstances left Americans in a state of trauma and denial, such that the glistening glamour of the 1950s provided a nice cover-up for the many, many socio-political issues relating to gender, race, and economics that were ongoing and only worsened by America's growing state of global dominance. The minds of everyday people had bought into the American denial of its own role in World War II, the Cold War, and various forms of oppression that and allowed the norms of racism, patriarchy, misogyny, and class inequality to fester and mutate, such that it created a moral divide between those who exploit, who had allowed evil into their hearts, and those who care for others and allowed their hearts to remain good. Lynch's work opposes power imbalances and the exploitation and abuse of the disempowered that they create, with a particular emphasis on the power imbalances that are created through patriarchal gender relations, in which men hold power over women and use this power to abuse women for their own benefit. His work also comments on the postmodern condition, and how rapid changes to the lives of everyday people through the increasing power of technological advancements, capitalist advancements, and American global dominance seeped into the way that people fathom reality and identity itself, such that individual sense of a permanent, fixed self gives way to competing narratives of one's own existence that are susceptible to sudden, permanent shifts, rendering one's sense of what is real, even their own self, as frail at best. Ultimately, Lynch seems to be making the case that World War II introduced such an immense evil in the world, via the advancement of technology towards the advent of nuclear weaponry, and we are living in a world where the traumas of this evil are affecting us in ways we can't even fathom, such that the 50s is representative of a cultural willingness towards ignorance, nostalgia, and covering up of the great evils that still exist in our world today. Knowing of these evils and how they're disseminated through sociological and interpersonal circumstances, political power, media, and increasingly incomprehensible technological advancements is at the very least instrumental in combating it. There is still good in the world, but evil has gotten more powerful than we could ever comprehend, so this good is in a permanent state of risk. Finally, Lynch's work is itself postmodern and uses its own artificiality to its advantage, playing with the fourth wall often and warping concepts of narrative, character, and suspension of disbelief at will in order to comment on the world outside of the art and remind us of the unreality of the art itself. It also uses these postmodern elements to comment on other contemporary works of art and on the nature of art as a medium of expression, particularly commenting on the dangers related to participating in the creation of art and the political influences of its creation. If any of these ideas don't sound like your deal, then this series might not be for you, but I recommend keeping an open mind and not shutting out ideas just because you're uncomfortable with where they might lead. Instead, consider watching and entertaining the possibility of these ideas, because even if you disagree, I hope there will be something worthwhile in the process of pondering. Now with all of that set up out of the way, let's talk about Lynch's work in full, starting with the rather vague and only semi-coherent experimental student film and all-time surrealist classic, 1977's Eraserhead.